within CX circles and maybe even more broadly, there's a belief that the experience revolution will be technology driven. I don't think it will be. I think it'll be technology enabled, uh, yeah. but it's going to be human driven. Uh, and you know, what I mean by that is at, at its heart, experience is about empathy and understanding. And that's where it starts, right? Understanding yeah. what motivates humans, what drives humans, how, how, do, how do you drive behaviors? Welcome to Conversations That Matter, a podcast from Unifor. Here, we explore the latest customer experience trends, sales insights, innovations in AI and automation, and more with well-known thought leaders and industry experts. Tune in and join the conversation. Welcome, everyone, to another podcast. I'm your host, Randy Kassar, and we have a fantastic episode today. We are talking to John Ward from Cigna. John and I had a, a prep call a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things that he said was the two podcasts that he listens to is New York Times Daily and Conversations That Matter. I did not pay him, but that was a great compliment. Uh, and what I love about our community is that everyone is sharing their thoughts and uh, best practices around how they can get 1% better within the world of AI and within the world of customer experience. So if you're out there listening in, thank you for listening in. And today's show is going to be great. So John, welcome uh, to today's show. Hey, Randy. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, so are we. So let's uh, let's get to uh, our questions of the day. Then we'll also do some rapid fire. Um, and as always, if you're listening in, we want to hear from you. Hit us up on on Twitter, or now called X, or on LinkedIn, just use the hashtag CTM podcast, CTM podcast. All right, so in your role as global head of customer experience at Cigna, um, we want to know what is one myth about that specific role that you hold that you would like to debunk? Sure, well, like you said, I've listened to enough of your episodes to know that this is the standard starting question for the podcast. and. Uh, and I love this question. It's one of the things I always look forward to uh, with every new episode. So um, I actually have two, if if you don't mind. Yeah, one is related sure. to the role, and then one is related more broadly to to customer experience um, and, and the work. So related to the role, and I think we've gotten better on this, but I do think there is still kind of a myth out there that um, people that are in roles like mine, heads of customer experience, um, care care mostly about the metrics that they are directly accountable for, which, which in our world tends yeah. to be measures of experience, satisfaction, net promoter score, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, good leaders of CX do, do care about those metrics. And at Cigna, we're lucky enough, those metrics are actually part of our enterprise scorecard. So they're, they, they actually impact, you know, how, how company ratings and compensation. And so they're actually, you know, they're actually codified at, at a pretty high level um, within the company as being metrics that matter. And me and my team are directly accountable for those metrics to um, to our executive leadership team and to the board. And by the way, not just for reporting the metrics, but you know, understanding why they're moving the way they're moving, translating that into insights that we can actually drive uh, that actually drive the work forward so that we can improve. Um, so, so we do care about those, but I think you know, good leaders of CX care as much about the other metrics in the scorecard, the ones that they may not be directly uh, responsible for, but should feel accountable for. Um, and so in, in my world, that tends to be metrics around, uh, you know, health outcomes, certainly around affordability, uh, operating expense improvement, you know, th those are rev revenue and, and income, obviously. Um, yeah. and, and, and great leaders of CX, I think, have done the work to understand the relationship between the experience metrics and the, the business metrics, the growth metrics. Such that yeah, you know we sure. can actually partner with with the business to say, okay, here's how experience can actually advance your agenda, um, and you know we've we've done a lot of that work at Cigna to understand those relationships, uh, so that we can be pretty pretty surgical about how and where to apply experience to drive the business forward. Awesome. All right. Well, that that definitely. Uh, so the myth there is, we shouldn't just focus on those CX metrics, but the business outcomes. The the results, the, the underlying uh, value that you're bringing to the business, right? Yeah, no, that's right. That we, we say a lot of, you know, we, we care about experience as an outcome, but we really care about it as an enabler of, of other outcomes uh, that we care about yeah. at the company, uh, that, the things that drive our growth. So um, yeah, so that, that's well said. Cool. Um, so tell us, uh, how did you get into your role? What's, uh, what's your background? Uh, yeah, so I, I've always been in very 
customer focused roles. I think um, okay. studied studied marketing in in college and have always been kind of interested in what motivates people, what drives behavior. So I actually started my career in market research on the uh, on the on the supplier side. So doing work for big corporate clients around you know segmentation and brand equity tracking and you know those sorts of things. Um, very cool. And so I did that for about the first five years of my career. I had had okay. done enough work with with corporate uh, you know uh, clients that I said, well, I want to go see what that world's all about. So. Um, yeah. so, uh, first, first corporate experience with at American express. Um, okay. and, uh, and one of my early roles at Amex was actually managing one of our co-branded card products. Um, and I was responsible for customer engagement, customer retention, and, and yeah. very quickly realized that, that I only, I only impacted, you know, a sliver of what actually drove engagement and retention. I had partners in in digital. I had partners in operations. I had you know other partners yeah. that were also impacting um, those outcomes. And so, in order for me to to do my job well, I had to really partner with those teams, make sure they understood what the strategy, what the objectives were, um, yeah. and and kind of you know create create a you know a, a community or a model where we were all kind of marching towards the same thing that we had clarity on who was doing what. And then this was like before the before the times when you actually had defined CX roles. Um, yeah. and, you know, in, in corporate environments. And so kind of d did that for the product that I was working on, realized it was an opportunity across the full range of first co-branded products and then more broadly consumer products. And, you yeah. know, and eventually over, over a couple of different roles that, that led to, um, uh, a VP of customer experience role, uh, within the consumer card division at Amex. Okay. But in, in that role was kind of responsible across the portfolio. So it wasn't managing the products. But was looking yeah. across the products and pulling in all of our matrix partners to understand um, how how can we leverage deep customer insights, marry that with business strategy to drive the right outcomes, namely, you know, experience satisfaction. In that case, you know, more card spend, more renewals. Th those are the metrics that we cared about. I was going to say, uh, when did the signal come about? How yeah. did you transition? From, well, from so <clears throat> so I had a you know, I love the MX, love the people at MX. Um, uh, but eventually kind of had, you know, broader aspirations for, a an enterprise all role. So the, the experience role at, at Amex was yeah. just within one division of the company. The role that I'm in now at Cigna looks yeah. across all of our, um, all of our lines of business or so commercial lines of business our individual lines of business, um, our health services business and, and yeah. is really, um, is really, I'm really responsible for kind of a couple of things. One, bringing forward, uh, customer and marketplace insights to help drive strategies and roadmaps um, to working hand in hand with, uh, with our, with our business partners and our functional partners to mm -hmm. activate on those insights through, you know, through uh, journey design and, you know, the requirements that we want to build to actually deliver real experiences to customers. And then on the back end, all the measurement, right. Of when we've actually put something into market, uh, right. is, is that doing what we hoped it would, would do? And again, not only from an experience standpoint, but is it actually driving the business value that we need to drive? So looking at all those things as well. Very cool. And you've been at Cigna for how long? Been at Cigna for six years. Yeah. Just past six years, uh, about two weeks ago. Awesome. Yeah. After, after five years, you get a gold watch or, uh, what <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> you know, I can't remember what, Does I, anybody got. Do that anymore? what I got actually, but it's funny, actually, <laughs> one, one of the stories I tell is, um, you know, because we just kind of talked about my my career journey, but I, yeah. I started my career. I spent a couple of years at a digital agency back during the dot com kind of boom and subsequent bust. I yeah. was then I was then in financial services 0809 when the credit crisis hit and had a front row seat. That, you know, to that, and obviously yeah. you know now in healthcare coming off of well, hopefully coming off of a uh, a global health pandemic. And so whether you know whether these things follow me or I follow them, I, you know, I don't know. But but those have actually been really really um, tremendous both learning experiences for, for me personally, for sure. but also for the work that I do, um, golden opportunities to kind of bring the, the you know, company's values to life in a very real way for customers. So it's been, uh, I've been yeah. fortunate in that way. That's very cool. Awesome. Great, great background. Um, all right. So on this podcast, we, you know, we talk a lot about AI. Uh, in Unifor, we're talking a lot about uh, how the future of enterprise AI is human. Uh, and I'm kind of curious from your perspective, what role does AI play in Cigna's strategy for not only the customer experience but also for the employee experience? Yeah, I love this question, and I know that's a it's a big, big, well, big, 
area of focus overall, but also of, uh, of the conversations that you've had with with former guests on the podcast. So, um, so starting point, and, and I love the way that you frame this as a as a kind of a present term is because it's it's not just the future, right? We right. we've been using AI um, to to actually deliver value, and 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 it's it's had some really good applications. So, you know, I talked a bit about some of the role that my team plays, right? We, I, I manage um, the the voice of customer programs for the company. So net promoter score in, in all its forms. Um, and, you know, and we, we have tools that, that we've kind of overlaid onto that to be able to make, make sense of what our customers are telling us. So, you know, we ask a yeah. lot of questions in kind of closed ended form and we get, we get quantitative data from that, but the richness is, is in all that unstructured data when we ask verbatim questions and we ask for feedback. And so, you know, so we have tools that can help us understand the themes that that are coming through in the in the words that our customers are 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 using to describe their experiences of the relationship with the company, um, to do things like sentiment analysis to know like what what is what is the what's the emotion that's coming along with those words, um, and and that's really helpful as we think about uh, getting getting very targeted around the the areas of opportunity for us to either lean further into the the bright spots the things we're doing well or to to go after those. Um, opportunity areas, um, in, in yeah. a, like in a very, in a very precise way, uh, you know, do, doing some, some things also, uh, through natural language processing, right. Given, giving agents the ability to get kind of real time input and feedback, like uh, in the moment on, on, on a call with a customer, like those tools are, those tools are in use today. Um, and, uh, and, and actually delivering value looking forward. Uh, and you know, this is where gen AI comes in. And obviously this has been, this has been the year of gen AI. Um, you know, we see a lot of really powerful applications, sure. certainly within, within our space. And, and I think we're just kind of scratching the surface, right. In terms of, in terms of what, what those could be, but, but, you know, high, high level, um, and especially within, within our business, within healthcare, I and mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of back office stuff, right. When, when you're talking about claims and, and, and those sorts of things where yeah. you know, you've got, you've got large, large data sets and a lot of unstructured data. Um, and, yeah. and there are absolutely applications there. And, and those are important because getting getting really good and really efficient there obviously there's efficiency opportunities but that's the place where we prevent issues for customers before they even happen uh and so that those are some really sure. important applications sure. and then and then obviously front end applications through service delivery through you know digital all those sorts of things i mean they're you know so so yeah. right now we're working through what what are those use cases where's the best where's the best place and it's the highest and best use of, of the capabilities how do we test and learn um and then scale very cool very cool I, I like your strategy. I like I like kind of where it's going. Um, from a uh, kind of organization organizational perspective, uh, who do you partner with to to build that uh, AI strategy and, and to empower others within the organization uh, with the, all the insights that you have? Yeah. Well, so so number one, we've um, we've actually established an AI center of excellence uh, because we recognize um, the importance, the opportunity. And also the need to go about it in the right way. Um, yeah. And so, you know, we're closely partnered with, with that team, um, uh, subject matter experts, right, in, in, in this yeah. space and really kind of on, on cutting edge. Um, and then, you know, more cross-functionally, it's, it's, you know, it's working with, with all the teams. Again, I, I talked about back-end and front-end, and so it kind of cuts all the way across. Right. But, um, but I think the important thing is, uh, and we'll probably talk about this, you know, later on as we get into it, but is the use yeah. cases, right? Like, it, you know, it, the problems to solve um, because it's a gen AI is a, you know, is a really powerful tool, but it's, it's one of the tools in the toolbox and we've got to be really deliberate about, about the problems that we're trying to solve. And so, you know, whether that's, yeah. whether that's, if there's an application within, within a contact center environment, that's, that's, that's where we're going to go and partner. If there's an application within a digital context, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to partner there. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, we have other CX leaders that are listening into this uh, as you were before, uh, and they're in a wide variety of industries. So, you know, healthcare. I love uh, what you're talking about, and, and it's interesting to kind of hear how Sigma has a center, center of excellence. Um, but what advice would you give other CX leaders that are either in healthcare or outside um, as they start their kind of AI journey? Um, well, I, you know. Hopefully this doesn't sound like a vanilla answer, but uh, it, it kind of continues where, where I ended the last one, which is yeah. start with the problem. Um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of 
everything you read, right, about the risks of AI, in particular gen AI, are around yeah. hallucinations and biases. I, I actually think that the 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 biggest near term risk isn't with the capabilities themselves; it's with us, the users, in yeah. in, in thinking that it's um, that it that it's a solution, and then you go looking for the problem. And it's got to be the other way around. Um, used this analogy before, uh, and I certainly didn't, I, I can't claim ownership of it, but you know, when, when you've got a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. And I think that is, that is the biggest risk. Um, okay. so start with the problem, understand the, the, the biggest, most pressing problems to solve, and then think about what are the tools in the toolbox that we have to actually solve that. In some cases, we're going to find that's a, it's a gen AI use case. In some cases we're going to find yeah. it, it might be another, another capability. But as long as you, as we orient on the problem and always start with the problem, then, then you kind of work your way forward from there. So I think, I think that's, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, so not specific to Gen AI, but certainly Gen AI has sort of shined more yeah. light on that, um, as a, as both an opportunity and a challenge. Well, yeah, I mean, we're not trying to, to integrate technology just to integrate technology and, and just please the customer because they, they see a shiny object, you know, they still want to get their problems solved. That's right. Uh, the issue is solved, right? And so whether that's a process thing internally, whether that's a resource thing, whether that's a, you know, it could be a budget thing, like uh, maybe it's a workflow thing. Maybe people aren't talking to the right people and that has nothing to, at, least at the onset to do with AI. It has to just do with kind of collaboration. Yeah. That's maybe right. AI, maybe, you know, maybe AI enables that, um, but you need to figure out what that is first so that you can map it into your, you know, to the AI platform in terms of like the conversation design. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we the first question I said, I was going to give you two and I think I only gave you one, but you just nailed the second one, right? Which is, you know, I think that, I think that within, within CX circles and maybe even more broadly, there's a belief that the experience revolution will be technology driven. I don't think it will be, I think it'll be technology enabled, uh, yeah. but it's going to be human driven. Uh, and you know, what I mean by that is at, at its heart, experience is about empathy and understanding and that's where it starts right understanding yeah. what motivates humans what drives humans how, how do how do you drive behaviors uh and so the the tools and the technology can help deliver on that but but not before you have that deep understanding and so i think it will be technology enabled but but human driven uh and if it's the other way around then you know then we're going to continue to sub-optimize <laughs> yeah yeah um as a leader yourself of a CX organization, um, there's a lot of shiny objects that are being thrown in the industry in terms of adopt this, adopt that, as we've talked about. Um, but how do you kind of want to ground yourself, one, and then two is how do you foster a culture of innovation that can quickly adapt to this? Because things are happening so quick and the consumer expectations are so are. are are, are needed even quicker sometimes. So how do you, how do you deal with that within your, within your team? Yeah. Well, so, so number one, and again, this is going to sound kind of basic, but you know, l listen to customers, right? We spend a lot of time parsing through that data and that insight. And, and what we hear more often than not is, um, what customers consider really good experience mm -hmm. sometimes is, is what we would consider kind of mundane. It's just nailing the basics. And so, um, yeah, I do think there's, there's a, there's a, a need for, and space for thinking about like next generation experiences or really innovative things or things that the customer has never seen before. Um, yeah. but not before you nail the basics. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity for, I mean, improvement in the experience, but, but, but value, uh, yeah. in, in getting better at nailing the basics. And so I think making sure you have a perspective on how am I waiting the, the blocking and tackling meat and potatoes, nail the basic stuff with, you yeah. know, with, with the innovation. Cause you, you gotta be able to yeah. do both. That can't be an either or, but, but they have to happen in relative proportion, you know, to, to one another. Um, and so, you know, so I think that's, I think that's important when you talk yeah. about like innovation and customer centricity, like the starting point is always, you know, mission and values. Like you got to anchor to the company's mission and values because you know, that, yeah. that's, that's your, that's your grounding point. But, but beyond that, I think it's about, it, it's really about creating the right environment and having the right talent. And so from an environment standpoint, I think it's about, um, empowering people to, to ask questions and to challenge yep. and to have open, open discussion about, you know, uh, different, 
paths forward, different approaches, you know, those sorts of things. Um, I I think that diversity obviously is really important. And I'm just, I mean, it's certainly gender diversity and ethnic diversity, but just diversity of thought is really important, especially in our business. We, we, we serve, we serve all different types of customers. And so we have to have people that, that have very diverse thought thoughts and experiences and, and, and life, uh, life experiences, those sorts of things in order, in order to really connect on a human level with the customers that we share. So I think, so I think that's really important. Uh, it's also that's also kind of part of the part of the talent strategy as well. But the, the other thing I'd say just on talent is I think a really undervalued skill, certainly for the work that that I do, but probably more broadly is curiosity. Like you know, being sure uh, that's for sure is that's going. like that's uh, yeah. No, sorry to interrupt, but, but I think we're on the same page. Like curiosity is is key towards any hires that I do. It is in some ways all the resumes coming in are all the same skill sets. But what I want to know is whether you're one proactive, but also whether you're curious to learn about the next thing and to want to be a better either person or to, to make the company better. So that's, I think we're on the same page, right? hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. And that's, you know, that's, that's not just curiosity about customers or what makes them tick. It's curiosity about internal processes or internal systems yeah. and how things work and why they were designed the way that they were designed. I mean, you, know, you hear examples all the time. Well, that's just the way it's always been done. Or, or, oh you know, gosh, my, my, my favorite, my favorite working as designed. Well, maybe it wasn't designed all that well. So, you know, having yeah. the curiosity to ask those questions, do it in the right way. Right. Be, you know, because, yeah, you, you know, but, but having the curiosity to kind of d- dig, dig deep and dig further to really understand so that you can then say, okay, well, what might a different path look like, or how might we optimize that? Or how might we improve that? Really, really, really important. Yeah. Um, and so I, 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 like you value that, uh, from a talent perspective yeah. immensely. Yeah. Um, gosh, we're, we're, I love that we're on the same page. Um, I, I mean, I, I've been here for three and a half years, started in, uh, originally started in January, 2020 consulting for a bit and then started uh on march 16th right when COVID started uh full time and so some people think see me as a long uh, tenure person here um but i i'm constantly like we've done this before we we gotta do something different we gotta be different uh, it's like the good old apple slogan right think different that's right uh so uh as we get to making everyone 1% better as we stand the podcast, you know, what's one piece of advice that you would give CX leaders listening to this podcast? Does that say they'd be AI, but like, what's, we've given a lot already. So I don't know if there's anything left. I mean, you, you definitely squeezes it all out, but is, <laughs> is, is there, uh, is there anything, uh, if, if you were talking to CX leaders at a conference uh, in a community setting, what's one thing that, you know, someone came up to you and like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be better at my job. What's one thing that they could do? Yeah. Well, I've, I've already given kind of my number one piece of advice, which, which is start with the problem, but I'll go beyond that. So a couple of things that, that, that I talk about a lot with, with my team. So number one is, you know, um, y- yes, we, we, we serve our customers 100%. So we got to know our customers. That's a given. That's kind of table stakes within, within the CX space. Yeah. Um, yeah. Be a student of the business. Like I always tell my team, you, you know, we have to know the business as well as our P and L owners know the business. If we're going to be effective, impactful, you know, business partners to them and, and serve their needs. So, so yeah. know the business because the, the magic in customer experience happens when you bring together the, the customer need and, and the business need and, and can solve problems that way. Um, so I think, I think that's really important. Uh, the second thing that I always talk about with the team is, um, you know, I, I, I use the phrase, how can I help? Right. So we all have jobs on paper uh, and it's important to be clear on roles, responsibilities, and kind of know what you're accountable for. But, but at some point, like the, what's on that eight and a half by 11 piece of paper goes out the window because when you're in there <laughs> trying to solve problems, you know, everyone's going to bring a different, a different skill set, a different set of experiences. And so I always say, yeah. you, know, you got have to have a, how can I help orientation? And sometimes you know, for some engagements, that's going to mean you're playing this kind of role. And for other engagements, it might be playing a different kind of role. And, you know, and so that's how you build the kind of relationships that, 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 you know, earn you the right to, to do more of what, what we love doing and what we feel accountable yeah. for, you know, for doing. And then I'd say the third thing, which kind of builds off the number two is, um, I think that doing good CX work, uh, requires a, 
problem um, orientation, but being solution oriented. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is the problem orientation is only to frame what it is we're trying to do, but you got to quickly right. get into now, how would I solve that? And, that, and that's the, so that's, that is the, that is the orientation, um, uh, you know, that, that I think pe people need to have. And it's, it's, it sounds a little bit, it sounds a little bit subtle. Um, but I think it's meaningful because, yeah. you know, if, if people get stuck on saying, well, this is the problem and that's the problem and it's just a problem, problem, problem. Well, okay. Okay. But when do we get, when do we get to the solution? And do you have a point of view and a perspective? And that, and that doesn't mean that it's be a, a my way or the highway or that you have a, a monopoly and all the good ideas. But a lot of times, uh, you know, you, you, you like, you, you may have done this too. Like you, you walk into a session, you start with a blank sheet of paper and everyone's kind of looking at each other. So someone's got to take that first step forward and say, here's what I believe. Here's my stake in the ground. And then have yeah. the courage to say, it's not right. Right. It may, maybe it's 60% yeah. right, but, but that's 60% more than if I came in here with a blank sheet of paper. So react to it. Tell me what, what you think is wrong about this. And I, I'm mature enough yeah. to take that feedback, but I know that that's going to get us to, you know, the, right. The ninety percent that we need to actually get something out the door, and I say ninety percent because nothing's ever at hundred percent, right? So, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. so I think I think having that courage and having a, you know, like I said, having kind of a, 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 a problem orientation, but but ultimately being solution oriented solution. is is really important. Yeah, that's really key. I mean, I think you go into a meeting, you want to, you can, like, say you're going to a, a brainstorm meeting, you want to be able to have some ideas, but then you want to. Mm -hmm. In the end, everything's going to meld together into a brand new idea that you never even thought of, right? That's, right. And that's where the diversity of thought comes in um, and the different backgrounds that people have to, to you know, get to, to where you guys want to go. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot about what 2023 is about in terms of AI and, 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 and Gen AI. Um, but what's going to be different in your mind in 2024? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one, if I had a crystal ball and I could predict it, I'd, you know, I'd be, I'd probably retire and, and, you know, and go, go off to a island somewhere. But, um, you know, look, one thing I know is customer expectations for what great experience looks like uh -huh. are only going one way. Uh, they're going up and, 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 you know, you hear people talk about this a lot, but in our space, like great customer expectations aren't informed by the best healthcare experiences that they've had or that they're having. They're informed by the best experiences they're having, period. And so, you know, uh, you, you have to understand that and you have to be able to kind of look, uh, uh, you know, across industry. And this, this requires kind of a, a customer orientation, not an internal, like not an inside out orientation to say, what are the best experiences that people are having out there? What problems are they solving? And what, what is the applicability of those problems and those solutions to what, what we're trying to do? Um, to try and to try and bring that in and say, well, what might that look like in a in our case in a healthcare context? Um, yeah. And so I, I think that anyone who doesn't think that customer expectations for experience are going to continue rising and rising fast um, is is going to get caught on the wrong side of this whole thing. And so you know you yeah. really have to stay stay out in front of that, making sure you're in in tune with customers, in tune with certainly with your competitors, but also in tune with what the very best out there are doing. And, you know, me, me and Mike yeah. are always doing that um, to say, what, yeah. what might, what can we leverage? You know, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. <laughs> There's no shame, <laughs> right? In, in, in looking for those, no. kinds of, uh, those kinds of examples and, and trying to pull them in. Yeah. yeah, even outside of your industry, right? Yeah, yeah, no, 100%, 100%. Yeah. 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 All right, awesome. Uh, well, we're at the time, we're gonna do a little rapid fire. We're gonna do some, uh, some quick uh, answers as best as we can. Um, some of them might be a little bit longer. I got one question there that might be a bit, a little bit longer than a rapid, um, but we'll, we'll go for it. Okay. Uh, you ready for it? I'm ready. Awesome. Uh, so if you were calling into a contact center and you could, uh, this person that was answering the phone, the agent that was helping you could solve your problem issue resolved. You're often, you're, uh, and you're totally happy. This person could be a celebrity, an artist, a musician. Who would this uh, celebrity, artist, or musician, dead or alive, be? Yeah, yeah. This is easy because uh, because th there's a there's one that comes to mind because I'm uh, I'm a little bit obsessed right now. Uh, <laughs> so it's a it's a it's a musical artist. His name is Harry Mack. Uh, for yeah. those that don't, I know love him. Harry. Now, do you know Harry Mack? Oh yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I, I, I watch his stuff all the time. He's yeah. like the lyrical master. Yeah. Like I don't, 
I, I don't know how he does it. it it's unbelievable. Uh, so um, anyway, so for, <laughs> for those listening who don't know, he's a he's a freestyle rapper and 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 just does things that I like that, that I like blow your mind. So um, and I really appreciate it. Again, looking for examples outside of industry, yeah. right? That right yeah. is is the you know the the improvisation and the creativity and like I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot to learn from yeah. that. Um, uh, so not only, not only would he kind of freestyle the whole service interaction to me, which would just be, you know, a hoot. um, yeah, I, you know, I think the, that, that, that kind of improv, that, that's a skill set. That's a skill set that's yeah. Yeah, obviously, obviously required for what he does, but yeah. th think about it, think about an agent, right? They don't know what someone's calling it about. Uh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> the whole thing is kind of improv. And so anyway, that, that, that's yeah. an easy one for me, uh, it, it would be Harry Mack, no doubt. Oh my gosh. Like uh, his main thing is like, he wants people to say, give me three words. And then uh, I'll do a you know a random rap on it, and it's all off the cuff. And so, could you imagine someone, either your AI tool like giving you the three words, or maybe someone, or maybe he says that like, you know, uh, I don't know, say you're calling into uh, your internet service provider, got you know lines down, um, <laughs> I can't work, and I need it up now. <laughs> and then I, I thought you were gonna freestyle there for a minute. I thought that's where you were going with that. That'd be great. <laughs> Uh, I've been, I've been known to be a lyrical master. My, my, uh, Twitter handle is DJ Kassar, but, uh, that's, that's all I got. Nice. Uh, first word that comes to mind when you say CX. Well, I, um, I actually don't like the term CX that that's, that's not a word, but that, but that's my reaction to that one, which is the, the function, certainly the functions come a long way, but, but, but we haven't come long enough that everyone just intuitively knows what, what CX means. And so I think we actually do ourselves a bit of, of a disservice when we just say CX and, and, and then the reality is CX means different things at different companies. And, you know, so there's still a lot of kind of explanation of, of what that actually, you know, of, of what that actually means. Yeah. Uh, first word that comes to mind when I say AI. Uh, potential. Yeah. And I think we've, you know, I think we've just, we're only, we are only just scratching the surface. And so I think, I think potential. Uh, if you weren't working in your current job uh, and money was not an object uh, that was needed, what career would you pursue? I would, um, well, it would be one of two things. I would either be a hardware store owner just because I'd love to kind of be the, you know, the guy selling hardware in the community and you know, having people coming in and, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah. Or I would do... Um, um, like furniture restoration. I'm a, I'm a bit of a, uh, I'm a bit of an old soul. And so anytime I, you know, like I, well, I, I have a pickup truck. So like, which is dangerous <laughs> because anytime I'm driving down the street and someone's put a piece of old furniture on them, I feel compelled to throw it in the back of the truck. <laughs> Cause they just think like that, you know, they don't build it like they used to. I'm kind of showing my age. <laughs> yeah. Like, so, yeah. um, anyway, so I, 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 I pick all that stuff up and I, and I'd restore it and, and keep it in the world. So, uh, one of those, two, <laughs> one of those two would be probably what I'd be doing. Awesome. And I, this uh, answer to this question might be what you just said, but what is your best day? And it doesn't need to be work related. It could be a combination of work and personal. Like what's your, what would be your best day? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's probably a bit, a bit mundane, but so I, I tend to be a morning person. I don't function very well unless I get a good workout in the morning, which I do, good. which I do get to do most days. So, so that's good, but, yeah. but it would always start that way just because it kind of it kind of, you know, for me gets, gets the juices flowing, gets the blood flowing, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. and, uh, so, so, so that would be number one. And then it, it would be a day of, you know, that I had also work and my kids had off of school and, uh, and, and frankly, just kind of spending time together doing, doing whatever it is they want to do. I have, you know, they, they're, they're into their sports. One plays ice hockey, one rides horses. And so we're, we're doing oh. that. I, I love going to do that stuff. We, we live, we live by the cool. coast. So we're out in, you know, kayaks or paddle boards. Any one of oh, those sweet. things could be, you know, could be good and make for a really good day. Um, but you know, but 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 that's the stuff that uh, uh, that's the stuff yeah. that, get, that gets me going. So yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, uh, that's the end of the rapid fire. Uh, you survived. All right, I appreciate <laughs> it. I appreciate. It. I made it. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Yeah. No, thanks for having me. This is a really good conversation, and like I said, long long time. Yeah. Uh, listener so it's it's nice to be on this side <laughs> now and, and and actually be contributing so uh, i so i really appreciate the invite yeah no problem uh and for those that want to reach out to you maybe they heard something that they were like man i want to know more about it what's uh, the best way to reach out to you uh, yeah best way to reach find me on linkedin um and you know uh, i think it's linkedin slash jww194 that's my that's my handle on linkedin and so you know reach out to me there i would love to connect i always love having 
conversations with with folks about this stuff. Cool. So yeah. All right, we'll make sure to put it in the show notes. Um, but uh, again, thanks so much. I appreciate your time today. All right, thanks, Randy. Appreciate it. All right, thanks everyone for listening in. This has been another podcast uh, from Unifor, and we are so excited for all of you guys listening in. So if you're listening to this on video or listening to this on your uh, commute to work, uh, you know, let us know. Uh, you can email us at podcast at unifor.com. Have a great day, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Conversations That Matter. Subscribe to our podcast for more great content. And if you want to learn more about the topic we discussed, visit unifor.com today.